Properties of congruent polygons. This is lesson 4.4. We're in the middle of chapter 4. We've got six previous lessons, and you can go to the description and click on the geometry playlist if you've missed any. Geometric figures are congruent if they are the same size and same shape. Corresponding angles and corresponding sides are in the same position in polygons with an equal number of sides. Two polygons are congruent polygons if and only if their corresponding angles and sides are congruent. So triangles that are the same size and shape are congruent. So here we've got properties of congruent polygons. If you take a look, we have a diagram corresponding angles and corresponding sides. So look how messy this looks. Well, for every arc, like this one arc, it means that it's congruent to this one with one arc. An angle with two arcs is congruent to the angle with two arcs, and three is congruent to three. Same with the sides. One tick mark means it's congruent to this one with one tick mark. This side with two is congruent to that side with two, and this side with three is congruent to that side with three. And because the three sides and three angles are congruent, the triangles are congruent to each other. And take a look at this. We've got a couple of rectangles, and we can see that all the corners, all the angles, are 90 degree angles, aren't they? So they are all congruent to each other because we know they're all 90 degrees, but this one would be congruent to this one, and so on, okay? And we can see the tick marks on the side, so this side is congruent to this side, see? So it's almost like this, tri this rectangle, we could stand it up like this and then compare them side by side, see? And because all the angles and all the sides are congruent, those two polygons are congruent. Two vertices that are endpoints of a side are called consecutive vertices. Consecutive means to follow one another without interruption, one after the other. So we've got A and B, that's a pair of consecutive angles. B and C, that's a pair of consecutive angles. C and D are consecutive, and D and A are consecutive. Okay? And that brings us to naming polygons. To name a polygon, we write the vertices in consecutive order. So we can go clockwise or we can go counterclockwise as long as we do one after the other. So this could be polygon A, B, C, D. We could start here and do B, C, D, A. We could start here and go counterclockwise and do D, C, B, A. We could also start here and do counterclockwise and do A, D, C, B. But we can't start here with A and then go to C and then go to D and then go to B because that's going to be crisscrossing, and that's not consecutive order. In a congruent statement, the order of the vertices indicates the corresponding parts. So if we had A, B, C, D, and then we had P, Q, R, S, we would know that A and P were the first letters, see, and that they would be corresponding parts, okay? So take a look at this drawing. We've got triangle RST and triangle XYZ. They represent the triangles of a roof truss. It's the supporting beams of a roof for a garage or a house. If triangle RST is congruent to triangle XYZ, we can identify all the pairs of corresponding parts. So we'd have corresponding angles, R with Z, S with Y, and T with X, and then the corresponding sides, we would have segment SR is congruent to segment ZY, segment ST is congruent to segment XY, and segment RT is congruent to segment ZX. And all three angles and all three sides are congruent, so we know these are two congruent triangles. And if you look at this one, it kind of looks like this would be the line of reflection, and this one flipped over to here or vice versa, this one flipped over to here, see? It's like a reflection. Using corresponding parts of congruent triangles, we can find the value of x. And take a look at this diagram. We can see there's a 90 degree angle here, and that means that that's perpendicular. And if this is 90 degrees and this is perpendicular, then that's gotta be 90 degrees. So we know 6x minus 12 is equal to 90 degrees. We can use that. We can see e is 21.6 degrees. So we've got the angle FHE, that's this one right here, and FHG, this one here, are right angles. That's the definition of perpendicular lines. And FHE, this one, is congruent to this one. That's right angle, 
congruence theorem. If they're congruent, they're equal, right? So we've got the measure of angle FHG is equal to the measure of angle FHG. That's the definition of congruent angles. We can write 6x minus 12 equals 90. And we can solve for x. And we get x is equal to 17. 102 divided by 6 is 17, so x is equal to 17. Same diagram, different problem. We can find the measure of angle GFH. GFH, so it's going to be this one right here, okay? We know that the measure of angle EFH, EFH, that's right here. Remember, we're trying to find this one. We know this one plus this 90 degree one plus this 21.6 degree one should equal 180 degrees because of the triangle sum theorem. We add the 90 and the 21.6 and we get 111.6. So we can add the measure of e, angle EFH, this one right up here, to these two measures to equal 180 degrees, right? We can solve for the measure of angle EFH by subtracting the 111.6 from each side. We get 68.4. So we know this one right here is 68.4. Well, G, angle GFH, the one we're looking for, this one right here, is congruent to this one. That's the corresponding angles of congruent triangles are congruent. The measure of angle GFH, this one here, is equal to this one. If they're congruent, they're equal, right? That's the definition of congruent angles, which means if they're equal and we know that this one is 68.4, we know that one's 68.4, okay? Now I have two proofs for you. They're two column proofs, and let's see if we can figure this out. All right, so we're going to be proving triangles congruent. So look at this diagram as I read the given. Angle P and angle M are right angles. See them in pink? R is the midpoint of segment PM. We can see that right in the middle. And segment PQ is congruent to segment MN. So this is congruent to this. We see the one tick mark on each one of them. And segment QR, this part, is congruent to NR, this part. They both have two tick marks. We need to prove that triangle PQR is congruent to MNR. So our first statement is that angle P and angle M are right angles. That was given. That was the first part of the given. And our second statement is angle P is congruent to angle M. That's the right angle congruence theorem. Number three is angle PQR, PQR, that's this one up here, is congruent to MNR. So we can mark up our diagram. We can say, okay, this one is congruent to this one, okay? Number four says angle Q is congruent to angle N. Well, that just goes from what we did here for the vertical angles theorem. That's the third angles theorem. Number five says R is the midpoint of PM. That was given. Number six says segment PR is congruent to MR. So segment PR right here is congruent to segment MR. Okay? So now we've got three tick marks here. Look, we've got this angle is congruent to this one. This one is congruent to this one. And we've got three sides, don't we? Number seven, so the, the PR is congruent to MR was the definition of a midpoint because it told us in the given that R is the midpoint, okay? So number seven says segment PQ is congruent to segment MN and segment QR is congruent to segment NR. That was the other part of our given, which brings us to number eight. Triangle PQR is congruent to triangle MNR because of the definition of congruent triangles. So we've got all these congruent angles, we've got all these congruent sides, we proved they were congruent. Now take a look at this one. Notice that there's an orange line here, a green line here, a blue line here, and we've got some arcs, okay? So look at the diagram as I read the given. The orange segment JK is perpendicular to the blue segment KL, and the green segment ML is perpendicular to the blue segment KL. Angle KLJ, KLJ, so that's this one right here, 
is congruent to LKM. LKM. So this angle is congruent to this angle. There's one arc there, there's one arc there. It's also given that segment JK, the orange one, is congruent to the green one, segment ML. And it's also given that segment JL, this one going on a diagonal, is congruent to MK, this one going on a diagonal. So we need to prove that triangle JKL is congruent to MLK. We need to prove this triangle is congruent to this triangle. So they're kind of overlapping, aren't they? So here's our statements and reasons. Number one, segment JK is perpendicular to KL, and M segment ML is perpendicular to KL. That was given. That was the beginning of our given right here. Number two, angle JKL and angle MLK are right angles. That's the definition of perpendicular lines. We saw that they were perpendicular, so we know they're right angles. Number three, angle JKL is congruent to angle MLK. That's the right angle congruence theorem. We know they're right angles, so they're congruent. They're both right angles. Number four, angle KLJ is congruent to LKM. That was given in the middle right there. Number five, angle KJL is congruent to angle LMK. That's the third angles theorem. KJL, KJL, this one with the two arcs is congruent to this one with the two arcs. Okay? We've got, that was the third angles theorem. We've got Segment JK is congruent to ML, and segment JL is congruent to MK. That was given. That's the bottom of the given right here. Which brings us to segment KL is congruent to segment LK. Well, how does that make sense? KL is congruent to LK. Look at KL is congruent to LK. What's happening here is, for number seven, both triangles share that segment. So this triangle has that segment, and this triangle has that segment. So it's saying this part of the segment for this triangle is congruent to this part of the segment for this triangle. Okay? That's the reflexive property of congruence. And that brings us to 8, that triangle JKL is congruent to triangle MLK. That's the definition of congruent angles. Okay? So to prove two triangles congruent, we must show all three pairs of sides and all three pairs of angles are congruent. And I wanted to show you this real quick. Depending on the textbook you have and the publisher, you're going to have different congruent marks. Some of you are going to have one arc here to say it's congruent to this one arc and two arc is congruent to this one and three is congruent to that one. Some of you are only going to have one arc, but they're going to have tick marks thrown. So this one tick mark is congruent to this one. These two are congruent to these two. These three tick marks are congruent to that three tick mark angle. See? So depending on which book you have, you're going to have different types of markings, but just know that if you see two of something, it's congruent to the two of something in the other one. Okay? So now what I want you to be very, very careful of is the difference between equal and congruent. These are congruent. They are not equal because this is PQR and this is MNR. Two figures are equal if they have the same points. They're the same figure, but congruent means exactly coinciding, having the same size and shape, but maybe different points. So because these have different points, they're congruent. They're not equal, okay? Our next lesson is side-side-side congruence. We're going to talk about triangle rigidity, and we're going to talk about included angles in 4.5a. So my advice is, whenever you see me doing a proof, write it down. Freeze the video and write these down. Write down all the statements, all the reasons, and try to copy the drawing and what we're doing. Because you're going to come across this in homework, and wouldn't it be nice that you've already got a similar one done? as a guide or maybe even as the exact problem, all right? And make sure you're writing down all the properties and definitions and uh, theorems, corollaries, axioms, okay? Keep it up. I'm proud of you, and I'll see you next time. Have a great day, and hit that like button. Bye.